Boa tarde a todos, bem-vindos a mais uma sessão dos Diálogos do Cérebro. Uh, vou passar a falar inglês, existe tradução simultânea, temos hoje dois uh, oradores de língua inglesa, uh, portanto, uh, sinto-se à vontade para usar a tradução simultânea se acharem necessário. Uh, so I would like to welcome you all, in particular our two speakers of this late afternoon, uh, Larry Young and Hunter Halder. Uh, Larry is a professor of uh, neurobiology at Emory University. He works on the uh, neuronal basis of social behavior using animal models that span from voles to mice to primates, even to humans. 
uh, his work is not only fundamental but also has relevance for some social disorders like uh, autism. Uh, and, and Larry did uh, all his career in the US. He did his PhD with David Cruz uh, at uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, then he moved for a postdoc in Emory with uh, Tom Insel, and then Tom Insel became director at uh, NMIH, uh, and, and, and Larry basically became uh, faculty and then professor uh, there. So it's, it's a pleasure to, to have Larry with us today talking about the neuronal basis of social behavior. Then the counterpart that we always have in these brain dialogues is someone coming from an applied perspective to the topic that we are addressing and talking about social behavior. We would like to have someone here that basically illustrates nicely how social we are. And so I invited Hunter Halder that is uh, I, I thought he was the CEO, but he said he was the founder, uh, the president of the board, and also the slave. I think there are different roles. Um, so I don't know which one you will use today. Um, of uh, ReFood, so ReFood is an a NGO uh, that uh, addresses uh, issues uh, related to uh, redistribution of foods to, in excess to people in need, and so redistribution of resources, and illustrates very nicely uh, the will that we have to help others and to invest without having any immediate benefit uh, in helping others. So it, it's a typical thing of human nature to, to have this drive to care about others, and Hunter, I think, illustrates that nicely. The background of Hunter is very diverse. He, he graduated in, in history, but he, he, he never uh, had a formal role uh, following his, his formal education. So he has been, as he said, a serial entrepreneur involved in many, many different uh, uh, things. Um, he came to Portugal almost, I think, more than 20 years ago. Um, and while in Portugal, he has been active in, in many uh, different areas. Um, he's good with words. So when I met Hunter, he introduced himself as being a wordsmith many years ago, um, but then he became involved in uh, corporate team building, uh, and he said he only saw meaning in what he was doing in many different activities when he, he founded uh, ReFood and, and started um, giving meaning to his creativity and to his social creativity, I, I would say. So the way this goes for those of you that uh, are here for the first time is that we will have first the two talks and there will be no questions after each of the talks. We will then see the three of us there. Um, I'll try to promote some conversation between the two speakers, and then we will open up to the audience also to participate and, and to address the, the speakers. So without any further ado, I would invite uh, Larry to stage. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rui, for the introduction, and I want to congratulate you on a wonderful exhibit here. I think it's so important to be able to communicate science uh, to the public, and uh, particularly about the brain, uh, which is a topic that I've been working on for the last 25 years. So um, I'm interested in the neurobiology of social behavior, social relationships. Why do we form bonds? And um, as I think everyone here realizes how important social relationships are to us, how exciting they can be when they are strong, but also how uh, debilitating they can be if they are broken. And I'm going to talk about um, the insights that we've gained on how that works. Now this picture shows um, some of the most important uh, human relationships. Hold on, do we have a pointer? Okay, anyway, so the white one? Nope, okay. Doesn't matter. But um, so human relationships are, are, are very important, and this shows some of the strongest ones. So, for example, the bond between the mother and infant, the mother and baby, is very, very strong. And not only humans show this, but all other mammals show the same thing. So, the idea is that maybe we can learn something from animals about human bonding if we choose the right animals. Now, humans are different from other animals, most other animals, in the sense that males and females partner as well. We have a thing called love. 
romantic relationships. In most mammals, they don't do that at all. Males and female, rats, dogs, many species, they come to mate. After mating, they split, and the mothers have to raise their babies by themselves. So um, I'm very interested in, in how does that work. Now, how can we begin to understand how the human brain controls our behavior? We can learn a little bit by taking people and put them in a brain scanner and maybe ask them to do a task or to think about their loved one, for example, and you might see what brain areas are activated. But I'm very much more interested in the very fine details of what chemistry is involved and what genes are involved and what circuits are involved, the details of how it works. And so you cannot really do that in humans. So you have to really rely on studying animals. And these are the animals that I study. These are called prairie voles, and they are perfect for this under, uh, studying the biology of human relationships because like people, males and females come together. After they mate, there's a transformation that happens in their brain, so for the rest of their life, they want to be together. They have the babies, the, the father and the mother take turns caring for the babies. So it's a real true partnership, okay? Only 5% of mammals do this. Now, not all prairie voles are faithful and monogamous. Sometimes they might cheat. Usually they will come back to their partner at night. So maybe it's still a good model for human behavior. Some animals never even form bonds, so we can study individual variation. Why do individuals become different? And I want to talk about one molecule, focus on one molecule that has arisen to be very important in social behavior, and that molecule is called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the molecule that is released in a mother when she's giving labor. It causes uterus contractions to occur and the baby to be delivered. Doctors use oxytocin, inject oxytocin, to induce labor. After the baby is born, when the baby nurses, the stimulation of the breast causes oxytocin release, and that goes down to the breast to cause milk to be ejected. But what we also know is that oxytocin is acting in the brain of the mother to make that mother think that that baby is the most special baby in the world. Every mother thinks that, right? So what it does is actually makes the brain pay attention to social cues. And for a mother, you can understand why that's important. Well, it turns out that same molecule is involved in lots of different kinds of bonds. So in the, in the lab, we can study the bonding process of these voles using this test. It's called the partner preference test. And in this test, the guy in the middle is a male. He spent last night with that female over there, and they successfully mated. He's never seen this female here. Now, if this was a typical rat or a mouse, who do you think the male would choose to be with? The novel female. But prairie voles are different. Watch this guy. He's going to come over. He's going to check out the novel female that he's never seen before, and you'll see that he shows a little bit of aggression towards her. He's like, hey, you're not my partner. And he behaves in that way, okay? Now watch what he does to his partner. This is just after 24 hours of cohabitating with mating and all of the chemical processes that occur with that. And you can see he is there. So we can do experiments with large numbers of animals like this and to, to try to identify what brain molecules are involved. Um, and what we found is that if you take the vole and you inject them with oxytocin and give them another animal but they don't mate, that oxytocin is enough when it acts in the brain to cause that animal to form a bond. So we can stimulate a chemical, uh, sorry, we can stimulate a social bond with a chemical, oxytocin, okay, pretty powerful. Now what uh, to me is really cool is that there's different species of voles that look the same but they have very different social behavior. So prairie voles on the left are the ones that bond and they crave social contact. They have very strong social relationships. These guys on the, on the other side are called meadow voles. They are asocial. They prefer to be by themselves. They mate, after mating they split, so they don't form any bonds. So I have been using these two species in Atlanta to try to figure out what's different in the brain between those that can form bonds and those that cannot form bonds. And since oxytocin causes bonding, we thought first maybe Prairie voles have more oxytocin, and meadow voles don't have oxytocin. But that's not true. They both have oxytocin. They both give birth. They both nurse their babies. But they don't form bonds. And it turns out um, it's not oxytocin that's different, but uh, chemicals that act in the brain, like these, act because they bind to receptors that are on neurons. That's the only way they can act. 
And when we looked at where those neurons are that can respond to oxytocin, we found something very striking. This is the perivol brain, a slice through it. This is an area called the nucleus accumbens. It's involved in reward and addiction. And that, this area has loaded with oxytocin receptors in the perivol. In the non-monogamous species, it's not loaded with receptors. So the brains respond to the release of oxytocin very differently. They have the same oxytocin molecule, but the parts of the brain that respond are different. In the, anim the animals that form bonds, it's this part of the brain that's involved in addiction. And we know that if we block those receptors, the animals, uh, if they mate, they will not bond. We can completely manipulate the system. Now, that was the original work on pair bonding, but now we know it's involved in many different kinds of bonding as well. Even the relationship between a human and a dog. When your dog looks at you in your eyes, you release oxytocin in your brain. When you look at your dog in the eyes, they release oxytocin in the brain. And this is thought to help form this very strong bond between humans and dogs. Wolves don't look into your eyes. Cats don't look into your eyes very much either. Now, I want to just uh, summarize the, what we know about the chemistry of pair bonding in voles. Oxytocin's role, remember, in the mother is making her baby think that her baby is the most special thing in the world. It makes you perceive social stimuli. But there's also other things. Dopamine is important. Dopamine is released by cocaine, drugs of abuse, but also doing things that are exciting, like sex. So it is the combination of things like dopamine and the opiates, which is what heroin acts on, coming together, making your brain link the perception of your partner with the reward system, and you essentially become addicted to your partner. That's what I think a bond is. This is how it works. This is a brain that is um, of an animal that's mating, for example. Okay, the animal, this, let's say this is a virgin, never mated, when they mate, and they're successful at mating, the brain releases this dopamine and the reward uh, chemicals into the brain, and the animal says, wow, that was great. What did I do? Who did I do it with? Can I do it again? And if this is a rat, he'll spend the rest of his life trying to recreate this chemistry. But prairie voles have a little thing on top of this in that they are also breathing in the odor of their partner. And it is linking the perception of the partner into the reward system so the partner oops, becomes rewarding. The animal says, wow, not what did I do, but who is that, right? So here's, a, here's an example. Non-monogamous species, they mate, dopamine is released, the animal says, wow, it's rewarding. The brain, if it's a male brain, is perceiving, this is, smells like a female. I like females. I don't like males, I like females. And the male, his brain is tuned to find females to mate with. Prairie voles have a similar thing, except there's more precision. They're linking the identity of their partner with the reward system. Now that partner becomes inherently rewarding for the rest of his life. Okay, that's, that's how I envision pair bonding work. I'm gonna talk about a couple of other things that I think are important for relationships. We know that in people, when we lose a long-term relationship, that can be devastating for mental health and physical health. Loss of a long-term partner increases mortality, increases death, increases cardiovascular disease, stress, depression. In these voles, we can study brain chemistry related to what happens when you lose a partner. So, for example, we, take, we took brothers and put them two together, and then, uh, and then we took a male and a female, let them be together, so the male and female could mate and they formed a bond. The brothers just hung out, and then afterwards we separated them from their partner, or separated from their brother, or let them stay with their partner. And then we did tests that measure depression, okay? And I'm not gonna explain how these tests are done, but just to show that if a male is with his partner, they, don't, they show very low levels of depression. If they're away from their partner, the partner is taken away, they are depressed. Males, if they're just alone, away from their brother, are not depressed. This is another test that shows the same thing. So in other words, being with a, a partner and then losing that partner causes this kind of depression-like behavior. Also, rise in stress hormones. I experience this every time I leave my wife at home in Atlanta when I come give a talk like this. You'll see my wife again later. But it turns out we know some of the chemistry that happens when they lose their partner. There's an increase in stress hormones, and that shuts down the oxytocin system. No more oxytocin is released. 
If we, though, then apply oxytocin into that reward area, it's okay if you lose the partner. So they're no longer depressed. If you replace the partner with oxytocin, everything's fine. So actually, I think that this is a, a, an important mechanism to keep bonds together. So the formation of the bonds, if you've been in a long-term relationship, you know in the beginning of relationships, there's a lot of dopamine, there's a lot of excitement. You can't stop thinking about your partner, the young relationship. But later, that kind of goes away a little bit. I like to think, you know, tw um, 14 years ago when I married my wife, we also got a dog at the same time. And when I, in the beginning, when I would come home from work, my dog and my wife would both be equally excited to see me at the door. <laughs> Today, my dog is still very excited to see me. <laughs> Yet we're still together. And actually what happens is, it is that being away, you begin to miss the partner. And it is oxytocin, the withdrawal from oxytocin that creates that. So I think of bonding as a yin and yang of bonding. There's a positive, the building of the relationship, the reward, the pleasure of being with your partner, and the linking of the identity of your partner to your reward system, you're becoming addicted. But then just as the junkie maybe doesn't like to take heroin, but he does it anyway, um, the lack of oxytocin when we're away from our partner helps drive us back together to our partner, and, and these voles help maintain that relationship. So that's pretty cool. This is my wife now, and uh, I show you this study because I want to talk about this in relation to humans. This is a study that was done uh, where they took uh, people, men in relationships, and showed them photographs of their partner or another woman who was rated by college students to be equally attractive. And then um, they gave the men either oxytocin or placebo. And they asked the men to rate how attractive they were, the people in the picture. And so maybe a man who take, oxyto uh, take placebo would see a picture of his wife and say, mm, my wife is a seven. Seven out of 10, that's pretty good. But if they took oxytocin, they rated them eight or nine out of 10. But they did not rate other women as more attractive. Oxytocin specifically made them uh, made their partners be more attractive. And this goes back to that idea that in the human brain, there is a linkage of the identity of your partner into the reward system. And oxytocin can help release that. And we can talk later about ways that you can manipulate oxytocin in other people. But what's cool about this study, they did in a brain scanner to find out what parts of the brain were activated by oxytocin and the, the um, site of the partner. And these two little brain areas light up here. And these are the exact same two areas that I've showed you in the prairie voles that's involved in prairie vole bonding. And I wanted to show you this because I wanted to make this very important point that you can study things in animals, in animal brains, and learn something about how the human brain works. I'm just going to talk one more topic. And this is um, looking at a behavior called consoling behavior. We thought, these guys are monogamous. What if the partner is distressed? Will they come and show an empathy-like behavior to reduce the stress? So we took the partners and we would, uh, they would be paired together and then we would give the partner maybe a little stress, like a beep, 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 a stressor. This, the other partner from other animals was not stressed. And, uh, and then we would put them back with them and see what they would do. The first animal is a male who is reacting to his female who is, who is stressed. Okay. Yeah, so this, this one was not stressed. The male comes over and says hello and then walks away. This one, the male detects that his female has been distressed and he spends most of the time grooming her to make her relax. That actually causes her uh, cortisol levels to go down. So he detects that she's distressed and he goes over to try to take care of that. And it turns out uh, males will do that to their female partners, females do it to their male partners, siblings will do it to their siblings, and also individuals who know each other well will do it to the, who they know each other well. So this is a kind of a nurturing behavior towards your relatives, but also can be unrelative, non-relatives, okay? And I think this is relevant to humans. Metal voles don't do that. And what we found is that this same oxytocin molecule is responsible for this kind of behavior, this kind of consoling behavior. Empathy, acting to reduce the distress of others. And if you think about it evolutionarily, the first empathy is the mother, it can be a rat or mouse or anything, 
to take care of babies. And I think that in humans, um, the kind of consoling behavior that ends up in things like compassion and kinds of things that we're going to hear about in the next talk has its evolutionary origins in behaviors like maternal bonding behavior in animals. And I think I'm going to stop there. Anyway, I just want to make the point that animals have basic fundamental underlying neural mechanisms that cause them to engage in behaviors similar to we do. But I don't think that those voles are in love. I think they're bonded. I don't think that these animals are showing compassion. They're showing consoling behavior. But we can learn about human behavior from those animals. So I will stop there. Boa tarde a todos. Moro aqui 28 anos, levo grande parte deste tempo a aprender a falar português. E logo depois, o primeiro uh, vez do convidado a falar no Gulbenkian é em inglês. Então vou morar para em inglês. The headset's on. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to thank uh, Rui and the Gulbenkian team for the invitation, all of you for coming, and Larry for giving us an education. So, where shall we go from here? Maybe it's right here. So we got a, a look into the social brain from Larry, and my question is, why was I invited? And the answer, I suppose, is because there's a whole lot of social brains in ReFood, and I interact with a large number of them. And even though I resist learning, I have, in fact, learned a lot from the last eight years working in this area. So a couple of weeks ago, I saw the first in this series of dialogues, and it was uh, Susanna Herculino, alguma coisa. And, um, <laughs> And she showed this screen, which made me start thinking about that we do, in fact, have connections with all the people around us, with our families, with the people we work with, and the people we volunteer with. Uh, and all of that is also going on in this picture. So human beings serving social good. What is going on in our brains? And what's going on, from the best I can tell, is that passion and purpose and meaning get activated when we do volunteer work. When we put others' interests in front of ours, these things happen inside of us. They're not very easy to track. You can't find the chemicals. Uh, but it seems to be going on. And I'm going to maybe define these terms. Uh, passion can be considered about a sexual experience or suffering or uh, something that you're really excited about doing, caring deeply about something, being passionate about it. And this is the essence of the way we're going to talk about uh, passion. With respect to purpose, it's a reason, the, the reason that we're doing something. And meaning is that significance, a quality of attention and importance. And these are the things that, that strike me. And I want to invite you to experience these things. That might sound like it's an appeal to come and be a volunteer at ReFood, and it is. Uh, but I'd also like to invite you to experience it right now. And to do that, I'm going to ask everybody to put down their computers and pocketbooks and jackets and everything else that you have and stand up. Can you help me with this? This is going to be a scientific experience. You know, I can't walk over here. I can't see my words. <laughs> so we're going to test some of our brain's capacities and then try to draw some conclusions. The first one will be memory. The second one, imagination. 
With respect to memory, I'm going to ask everybody to think about someone that you really care about, a friend, a family member, someone you went to school with, someone that you haven't seen in a long, long time. Okay, so think about this person or these people that you miss, that you haven't seen in a long time. We all got that? Now the next part is imagination, another of our faculties of our brain. Imagine you're walking down the street and you see this person that you haven't seen in a long time. So how do you greet them? What do you do when you see these people that you care about? We give them hugs and with much enthusiasm. Is that true? Okay, so your challenge is to look at the person to your left and to your right and to greet them with that same enthusiasm right now. Hey, Larry, come here. <laughs> Okay, thank, thank you so much for helping with that. Now, it's okay to sit down now. Thanks a lot. Now, I'm going to suggest that that was a rollicking display of positive energy. And I think we could call it passion. So that's what I'm talking about when I say passion. Now, does anybody discern a purpose in this exercise? Why might I have suggested this exercise? What's the purpose? The purpose is to see how good it is to connect with other people. It's very good? Yes? So that's the purpose. Now what about the meaning? How did it feel to remember those people that you care about that you haven't seen in a long time? How good is it to remember the people we care about? Does it give meaning to our lives to have people that we really care about? So those are the three things that it strikes me about the work that I do, is that we see people who are passionate about their work, who have purpose, and who find meaning. Now, if I was smart, I'd stop right there and sit down. But I'm going to talk a little bit about refood because I'm always expected to do that. So, refood exists. And the question is, why? Why should refood exist? We only have one world. A third of all the food produced goes to the trash. An eighth of all the people who live on our planet are hungry. And we can say, well, this is a problem, this is a shame. But I'm going to suggest that it's something else as well. An opportunity. Because we have this food in our hands, and we have these people who are hungry around us. We don't need to produce food. We have it. All we have to do is change our behavior. So this is why refood exists. And before I get to the mission, I'm going to suggest that it would be really good if refood didn't exist. It'd be really good if all of the food was naturally given to the people who need it instead of thrown away. But that's not how we live. That's not the way our society is set up. So in fact, there needs to be a third entity involved between the restaurants and the pastry shops and the, and the supermarkets and the people who need the food. And that's why refood exists. As soon as this is no longer needed, I guarantee you we'll stop doing it and go to the beach. But that brings us to our mission. Our mission is three simple things. Rescue food, feed people, and include the entire community. Now, two of those things are very tangible and very rewarding to do. I don't know if there's any refood volunteers in the room, uh, but they know that when you rescue food, you go into a restaurant or a bunch of restaurants and come out with food, it's very exhilarating. It's very good to do this. It's hands-on. You know you're doing something good. And the same thing with preparing the meals and delivering to the people who need it. 
so both of these are very hands-on, very tangible, not, not hard to, to understand why we do it. But the third one, including the entire community, is much more intangible. Uh, but our, our work is, in fact, like a, like a stool with three legs. And if you pull out one of the legs, it falls. So the third one, entire, in, in, including the entire community, is just as important as the other ones. And that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Again, I'm not inviting you to become ReFood volunteers. But if you want to, you know, we'll take you. So the ReFood movement. Uh, it presents an, an effective response to that problem that we saw in the earlier slide. Uh, we, in fact, do rescue the food in real time and get it to people in the same community. Uh, so this is an effective local response. Uh, and our mission and our purpose is to empower citizens in their own communities to do the same thing. So this is what we're about. And uh, when we're talking about ReFood, it is also an independent, citizen-driven, 100% volunteer, eco-humanitarian community movement. All of this is true. It's an EPSS that uh, means that the Portuguese government recognizes it as uh, having value uh, for society. Uh, and we are working uh, on a neighborhood basis. And this is really one of the keys, is that it works locally. And I really do not think this would work on a citywide model or a countrywide model. It really needs to be a local, a local thing. Now, our model is a low cost, high productivity model. It involves all elements of the community, volunteers, food sources, beneficiaries, and partners. The way they're involved, first we can divide them into human beings and institutional beings. Both are very important elements of the community. Uh, the volunteers give their time to help. Uh, the partners, the institutional partners, give their resources to help. The food sources give their excess food to help, and the beneficiaries need the help. So this is the dynamic in the community. And it is a goodwill-driven model. There are no obligations. The volunteers do not have an obligation to do the work. They do it out of their free choice. Uh, the restaurants can, do not have to give the food. They give it out of their own will. Uh, and the partners, certainly all of our partners join us because they believe in the mission and they have the goodwill. So it's a, it's a goodwill uh, model. It's very important to us. It's very important that everybody in the community benefits. So the volunteers, in my view, are the first beneficiaries of this work because when we do this work, it makes our lives richer. So there's your first beneficiaries. Uh, the partners often complete their missions because uh, a company, for instance, has the first mission to make profit. Uh, that's what companies exist for. But they also have a mission to the community, a social and environmental responsibility. So everybody benefits. The food sources, you should see the relief on the part of people in the restaurants. When we take the food, they no longer have to throw it away and they can hear their grandmother saying, throw the food away, it's a sin. I'll translate that for you. <laughs> but uh, it, so this is our mission, and it's a, it's a daily operation. And then how does it work? It works in uh, three, three moments, three processes. There's the, there's the collection of the food. And the preparation, because nobody wants a dinner of a giant bucket of rice. Uh, everybody wants some rice, some, some fish, some meat. So we have to prepare those meals. And then distribution. We get the food into the hands of the families so that they can sit down at their own table in their own house and have their meal. Now, what kind of results does this produce? It took me a long time to realize this. But the first result is a perpetual source of free food. It took me a long time to realize this, but every time you go back to the restaurant, you leave with, a, with plenty of food. Every time, it's always there. So it's perpetual and it's free. And all we have to do is mobilize to take advantage of it. Other kinds of results. Local results. Local, I mean in us. Transforming food waste into nutrition is a result. Uh, unused resources in support of essential services, so people who give us space to work in. Uh, wasted time, lots of our time is wasted. 
and that becomes unforgettable experiences. Marginalized members of the community are transformed into valued beneficiaries, and uninvolved community members become agents of change in their own community. So I want you to notice the difference between the first two that I underlined, nutrition and essential services. These are tangible things. These are things that you can count, you can see them. But unforgettable experiences and a person who's marginalized suddenly realizing that someone values them uh, and people who become involved, uh, these things are intangible, but they're no less important. In terms of national growth, it began in a seven block area, including the Gulbenkian, uh, in 2011 with 30 restaurants, 50 beneficiaries, one volunteer rescuing 1,000 meals a month. Eight years later, there are now 50 centers, 1,700 food partners, 6,500 beneficiaries, 7,000 volunteers, rescuing 150,000 meals a month. Now, all of these things are countable. They're all tangible. They're clear social and environmental benefits. And we can lay them out. Oh, uh, there's so many in Lisbon that we had to put some of them in the ocean. Just <laughs> didn't have room for them. But we can lay those benefits out in clear terms. In 2018, we rescued two million meals. In that same year, and that same two million meals translated into a thousand tons of bio waste that does not go to pollute our environment. So these are, like I say, very tangible impacts that we produce. But it's not the whole story. And this talk, in fact, gave me a chance to think a little bit more about what that whole story is. So let's look at the same stuff again from a different perspective. Human growth. One person in a time of crisis made a simple purposeful decision to create meaning in his own life by helping others. I know this guy. Hundreds were moved to volunteer their time and energy in that first place. So that's how it started. And so what happened? Thousands of other people followed in communities all over the country also decided to invest their time in purpose and meaning for their own lives and in helping others. So this is a way to look at the same information with outputs that are much less quantitative, but nonetheless real. And there's your smiley face, Hui, that I know that you can bond with. <laughs> so why do people volunteer? 96% of them say that it adds purpose and meaning to their life. These are not uh, figures that, that, that I came across here in, in ReFood. These are uh, uh, scientific studies in the United States. Uh, and so I'll show you the sources of this in a minute. But 96% of people say that purpose and meaning is the reason that they volunteer. 95% say it's because of community solidarity. 94% report joy and happiness in what they do in their volunteer work. 78% say it lowers stress. And there's 25% who say it helps them manage a chronic illness. So these are the responses of thousands and thousands and thousands of volunteers. This is not ReFood volunteers talking. I hear this when the TV comes and does an interview and they ask somebody, how long have you been doing this and why do you do it? These are the answers that we get. So I'm sure that these are correct, but they are, they're from uh, formal studies, which for some reason is not advancing. But you're gonna have to trust me on the studies because I moved that slide around and didn't put it back where it belongs. Um, one of the things that struck me when I came to this exhibition, which is a marvelous exhibition, if anybody hasn't seen it, I recommend heartily to go and see it, uh, was not only the title, but the poem that it came from. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Emily to step in here with us for a minute. She's very shy, she's only gonna come halfway into the screen. <laughs> the brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one will the other contain with ease, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue. The one will the other absorb, as sponges, buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for heft them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do, 
a syllable from sound. Emily was good. Now, if you want to have an analysis of this poem, go to Google. They'll analyze it for you. You can see that. We don't have time for that. We have time just to talk about three key words, sky, sea, and God. The sky is vast, but it's also visible. And we have studied it and thought about it for many centuries. Now we see it much more clearly, but it's always been a topic that we could study and talk about. Uh, the sea is different. It's deep and it's obscure. It's very, people don't, still don't know much about what's under the sea. So it's much more difficult to know. But, um, and then the third one, of course, is completely mysterious. The idea of God uh, for, you know, atheists or for religious people, it's very mysterious. So about the, the visible part here. We can say, I'm suggesting, that, that she's talking about something that we can know. We can know the sky. It's always there. It changes. We understand it. We can think about it like astrology or astronomy, but it's there and we can see it. The, uh, the deep blue sea, not so much. It's less known. What's under there? Are there monsters in there? And it's, in fact, less knowable because it's so obscure. And then the last one, well, it's unknown and maybe unknowable. So there is a degree that I find in reading this poem of that which is certainly knowable to some scale, the sky, something which is much more obscure, which is the, the sea, and something that is completely mysterious and possibly unknowable. So this led me to my ultimate conclusion, which is not just the social brain, but the social brain to the third power. Starting again with passion, purpose, and meaning. This is my experience. What I understand from the work I do is that people are motivated by passion, by purpose, and by meaning, and that this changes their lives. The brain is inside our skull, and it is the most marvelous, complex structure in the universe. But it is limited to our skull. The mind, not so much. As we form bonds with each other, our minds extend to include those people. When we contemplate the sky, our minds extend and absorb the ocean like the buckets in Emily's point. And consciousness, well, this is a guy that doesn't show up all the time and we don't know much about him. But he does show up when there's complexity. And this is a room full of some of the greatest complexity in the universe. And lastly, the known, the unknown, and the unknown unknown. So this is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you with these things to think about. Uh, and one more quick activity. So I'm gonna let you contemplate the mind map that goes with this idea of the three things. And I'm gonna ask you to stand up once again with your hands free And this is much more complex than the first one. But we are the most complex structures in the universe, so we can take care of it. So I'm going to ask to close the rows, the people who are on the outside wing, to move over and close the aisle. This side, move over and close this aisle. Make a connection with the row beside you. We'll have rows all the way through here. Solid rows. This first side here. I'm gonna ask you to turn in this direction. And the second one, in this direction. Back this way. And the third one, in this direction. And the fourth row, in that direction. The fifth row, in this direction. The sixth row, seventh row, eighth row, ninth row, 10th row, 11th row, 12th row, and so on. And we should have Please turn, please turn, that's right. Now, uh, theoretically, we have someone's back in front of us. 
Anyone who is face to face with somebody needs to turn around. Okay, so everybody should have somebody's back clear. And we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to, to close, close in a little bit so you're not too far away from the other people. So close in a little bit. Walk backwards, walk front. Okay. Just close in so that there's not a lot of space between you. Can we do that? This is important. I'm going to ask you to put your hands in the air and prove to me that those hands are free. Hands in the air. Now we're going to, okay, we can put the hands in. Okay, we're going to use our imagination again. Imagine that the person in front of you is like one of those prairie voles that Larry introduced us to that's been through some stress. They've been through some stress and they need some relief. And what are we going to do about that? I'm going to suggest that everybody put their hands back in the air and put your hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you and massage that person. <laughs> massage. Give me the, give me, get, get up here, get up here. It's only a massage. <laughs> only a massage. Okay, let's turn around 180 degrees and show your colleague what a massage is. It's like this. This is how we do a massage. Now it's going to get tricky. Without taking your hands off, let's have a big ovation for all of us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope I didn't go over 25 minutes. Thank you. Not too bad? No. A lot of oxytocin in the air. Huh? There's a lot of oxytocin. <laughs> okay. So I would like to thank both speakers, uh, especially to Hunter for increasing oxytocin levels in the room after this exercise. Um, so I think we are now ready to interact after these two talks. Um, this part of, of the Brain Dialogues um, aims to promote uh, relationships, to promote dialogue between the, the speakers. So typically what we do is to ask each of the speakers to address the other with, with one question. Um, I know who wants to go. First, if whatever you want to start by. Yeah, just um, how do you think, after learning a little bit about neuroscience of cooperation and you know, social relationships, um, and maybe you, you, you've also looked and, and read that hugs maybe release oxytocin. Oh, yeah. uh, so you've actually done some research. So do you think it changes the way you think about some of the work that you do and how to recruit people? and, and um, well, By knowing do. something about the brain. Yeah, I do, I do. I, I think it fills in uh, a lot of empty space in our common knowledge about how we do the things that we do. Uh, I think it's, it's wonderful to know the mechanisms that are at work. And it's even better to know that we have a say in controlling those mechanisms. So the prairie vole who has attached to, to his mate and then goes out for a jaunt in the field, runs across another female, he might be able to think two times before he cheats on his prairie vault. And I think that we can do the same thing. So all of these uh, chemicals and all of these uh, systems are at work in our brains, but there's something else in there that goes with the complexity of our brains, which is our consciousness and our, and our, our own ability to decide what we're going to do. So it completes the picture for me. 
I would now reverse the roles and ask you, Enter, if you want to address Larry in, in any respect of his talk. I will. Um, I wonder if you think that the oxytocin can have clinical uh, relevance among people with autism and other, and other uh, challenges. Can it help to build bonding in people who naturally resist bonding? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's actually why I get the research from the NIH, the money to, to, from NIH to do this research. The idea is that if, if oxytocin enhances the salience of social stimuli so that you're tuned into other people, uh, that really would correct what's missing, what is deficit in autism, where for people with autism, they tend not to look into the eyes of others, not to read the emotions and things like that. So a lot of my research program is uh, working towards figuring out if we give people oxytocin or some drug that can stimulate oxytocin release, how does that affect brain activity? And, and we give it to people with autism. And trying to figure out how to use the combination of the drug and some behavioral therapy to improve the quality of life for people with autism or e maybe even schizophrenia. Can I follow up on sure. that? Um, I just want to share with you that in trying to do a little bit of research, uh, I looked up uh, Larry, because I wanted to know who was coming, and I, and I went to the YouTube and saw a talk uh, that he did, a, a TED talk. And he is uh, very, uh, the first thing I noticed is how passionate he is about the work that he does. This came through from the, the very first couple of scenes in the TED talk. And as it went on, uh, his passion increased and it hit a climax at the end when he started talking about the, uh, the potential for this work to change lives and to help people. And so I saw a steady progression in that little bit of research I did between passion and purpose and meaning. And I want to congratulate him for that and ask him if he wants to be the first person to bring refood to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to think about it. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> F following up on this, not on recruiting refood <laughs> <laughs> volunteers, but on um, passion, uh, purpose, and, and meaning. I mean, passion and, and purpose are well studied in, in brains, and you can use animal models for that. You know, you talk about emotions, you're talking about goals and goal directed behavior. What about meaning? Do you think that we can address meaning and how we search for meaning in our actions? Do you think you're full search for meaning as well, or could you? Yeah, I, I just, I, I believe that um, um, a lot of the behaviors that uh, in humans we think of as very compassionate and where we have meaning and passion, um, they do have biological roots. And so, for example, I think mothers, you know, one of the original sort of meanings is when a mother gives birth. And, you know, the, many of her drives are driven by reward, for example, dopamine and Passion, but, but also it may be that that kind of innate instinctive behavior, which is, you know, your brain is really organized to make sure that you know how to and you want to take care of those offspring. That is something that then in humans um, gets expanded to so that the target is not only the babies, but other members of your community or members of your group. And um, so that's the way I think about it, sort of. Uh, you can th think about the evolutionary origins of almost all of the behaviors that we do. But we do have an added bit of complexity because of our cerebral cortex that allows, you know, that distinguishes compassion from consoling or love from pair bonding. Okay. And, and in regard to engaging in, you know, activities like refood in, in helping others, um, you showed us that there's research on volunteers' behavior and from your own experience, um, the published research matches what you see in Refood Volunteers. Do you want to share with us your own drive to become involved in Refood in the first place? Well, if you've got the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to give, yep, the, I'll give the shortest version possible. Um, I 
kind of came from the opposite direction. I did a, I did a um, introspection about my life when I was 59 years old, so I was very young. And uh, I didn't like what I saw. I did not see that I had done very much for other people. And I found that some of the things I had done, though I thought that they were the right thing to do and were uh, productive and, and, um, and you know, paid well, uh, I found on closer inspection that they did not serve uh, good purposes uh, and certainly not the meaning that I wanted uh, my life to be about. So uh, I started with meaning and I found that it was not what it should have been. And then I decided to change that uh, by directing my passion, which is my ability to work, uh, toward a different purpose that would produce meaning. And so I kind of came from uh, an odd perspective uh, to launch ReFood. And uh, in fact, I had I'd started uh, with other projects that I thought needed to be done, had to do with human rights and fundraising for NGOs. Uh, and, and then very, very much by chance, I was at a dinner with my daughters sitting beside the salad bar and my older daughter, Mayada, who wishes to remain anonymous, uh, doesn't work out for her. Um, she asked, uh, what's gonna happen to the salad at the end of the night? And I just looked over at it and I said, well, it's going to the trash. And she said that that was, I'm going to have to use a Portuguese word. She said, that's a vergonha. <laughs> and because shame just doesn't do it, you know. And, uh, and I, like to, I like to picar. So I said, well, it's not just the salad that will go to the trash. Everything that's prepared and, and not sold and not going to be sold tomorrow will necessarily go to the trash. So the amount of food that's gonna to go to the trash just in this restaurant is not small. And it's not just this restaurant, but every restaurant in Lisbon and every restaurant in the world. So it's not a small vergonha. And, um, and she didn't like that. She wanted to blame the restaurant people. And I said, it's not their fault because they don't have an alternative. And that was the word that did it for me. When I said alternative, I got that light that you hear about. And, uh, and I sat down and wrote the, the draft of the ReFood movement at that time. And that, and that idea, that project, uh, quickly took over from the other projects that I was thinking about. And within three months, I launched ReFood uh, right over here. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's now time to open for questions from the, the audience. So those of you that would like to address either Larry or enter, please just raise the arm and there are people with the microphones that will come to you. I think there's someone here in the front. Hi, thank you for both your talks. Uh, when Larry was talking, I, uh, a question came to my mind. Do you think there's a connection between the need to have a strength in numbers for survival and, for example, a consequent need to have, and because of that, to have a, a strong social bonds and emotional bonds with other members of that species. And that's reflected then in the amount of uh, oxytocin receptors in the brain. Um, yeah, so, uh, so for different species that live in different niches, um, if, if they are monogamous, and they form these bonds, it's usually because there is some reason that that is a better strategy to produce offspring. So for example, maybe uh, in the prairie voles world, uh, there are weasels, predators. And if a male decides he will, his strategy is to produce many babies, but not attached to anyone, female. Uh, he may produce a lot of babies, but all of his babies get eaten. The, the male who decides to help the female raise the offspring, he will have few babies, but those genes are passed on to the next generation. Um, but for other species, social bonding is not important for their survival, and it's better not to be bonded. Just go out and have many babies. So it's a very interesting you know, example of how the env environment determines what is the best thing for a particular species to do. And if the best thing is to partner and form bonds, then your brain will evolve to make you need those bonds. I don't know if there are, there's another question there in the middle. 
while the microphone gets there, I, I'll use the time to ask you a question myself. So you just explained the evolution of bonding in an adaptive way. Yes. But you also mentioned bonding uh, relationships and also the volunteering work that Hunter brought e e here today that apparently don't serve that adaptive value to the individuals that perform it. So do you think that uh, basically is it maladaptive to express certain bonding behaviors out of context? No, I think that one of um, the reasons that for the great success of our species is that we not only do things that are most adaptive for our individuals, but we function as a group of many un unrelated individuals, but we work together and the success of our group, our tribe, our, you know, whatever the group has been over history has been um, facilitated by cooperation among individuals. So even if you cooperate with individuals who are not your descendants, you are making it more likely that your children and you will survive you know, through this kind of teamwork. And so I think that that's what we see in these kinds of efforts is that you know, that basic you know, original desire to take care of offspring has become, in humans, relaxed. So it's not so stringent on the babies, but to our community, our in-group, who we think are our group, and we help them. And if we have worked together you know, throughout history, it has been beneficial for our ancestors. There was a question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I, uh, the, the talk raised me an interesting question. Is the, um, uh, we consider ourselves as a r rational beings. <laughs> but um, it's interesting to know uh, to, at what point uh, our social behavior is uh, conditioned by our chemistry. Uh, and uh, we take for granted that we uh, we take um, the decisions based on our, our rationality and our emotions. But is uh, at the deep is is really like that? Uh, what part of the chemistry uh, is important to to do the the, 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 the the decision process? Well, I think it, you know when you think about how the brain works, the brain no neuron communicates to another neuron without a chemical a neurotransmitter. So I, can, I absolutely believe that almost everything that we do um, is acting through chemistry, maybe glutamate on glutamate receptors, you know, just a few neurotransmitters. But you're right that there is an emergent property. Once you get millions of neurons together, then suddenly we have rational thinking. You know, and that's maybe not easy to explain by chemistry, but I believe chemistry is involved. But I believe that, that um, the best way to think of it is that sort of urges, like when a mother has a baby, or she has this deep seating urge to sort of take care of that baby. She may say, I cognitively thought I want to take care of that baby, but I believe that there are, you know, the chemistry in our brain is making her make that decision. So many of the decisions that we make, um, we think that we're making a rational decision, but the chemistry in our brain makes us Make their so you know you think about drug addicts. They can say I, I'm deciding to take drugs, but really they are deciding that because the chemistry in their brain is making that be very desirable. Okay. Thank you. So that that kind of opens up the discussion for free will as exactly and uh, a I delusion know. or. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's, I'm not sure if it's a delusion. I think that we perceive, but the most important thing is, is how we perceive it. We, we perceive it as free will. Um, and if you get back right down to it, probably maybe it's not because everything is sort of defined by laws of chemistry or whatnot. But I think that there are so many neurons and so many synapses and all of that that somehow free will emerges. Okay. And did you want to add anything to this? Well, I think that that's a, that's a possible scenario. Uh, I think that, that all of the neurons and all of the chemicals are certainly involved, uh, but I have my doubts about who's calling the shots. And um, if we think of the, of, the, of the brain as the seat of the mind, a phrase that you used the other day. Um, my vision is that 
that this marvelous, wonderful instrument, which is our brain, which makes a lot of suggestions for us, and, uh, and it also does our will. And so there, there are people who receive all the oxytocin and still reject the baby. I'm not defending that decision, I'm just saying that it happens. And there are people who, who are uh, attacked, uh, someone who wants to take their life, and, and yet they'll turn around and forgive that person. So I think there are enough uh, instances of overriding, of free will, overriding the mechanisms that it, that uh, in my view it does exist, uh, but, I, but it doesn't take anything away from the structure that is, the, is where we're sitting. But I think we're separate from that, and I think that's uh, the great mystery of consciousness uh, is uh, what is it, where does it come from, uh, is it a thing, or is it an illusion? And that when, when we get a little closer to answers on that, we'll know who's, who's driving the bus. So, okay, over there. I think there's a microphone there. Where is the microphone? I'll, okay. I'll Hi. Try. Young lady. Thanks so much. It oh, was sorry. a pleasure to hear you both. Um, my question is regarding the theme of lost that you talked. I did research um, considering the role of community uh, to help Alzheimer, people with Alzheimer's disease uh, feeling better and having a better quality of life. And I found something interesting, but I didn't develop more because I'm not a psychologist, but maybe I should uh, search in it, that the, the three women that I interviewed, the families, start developing more symptoms and start getting way worse after the loss of the husband. Mm -hmm. And when I talk with um, uh, a psychiatrist, he said that it has nothing, there's no proof relation. So I wanted to ask you, is it possible to have a connection between the loss of the, the partner and uh, in some way the, the deterioration of the, um, of the neurons and then to have part or have a paper in Alzheimer's disease? They are, they're, they're, if there's some kind of researcher that is studying that? I, I can't point to... Um a researcher who has studied that um, specifically, maybe that's why your psychi the psychiatrist said that uh, it did not exist, but I think you are correct. Uh, it's just not studied very well. That, you know, when, when losing a partner, you know, it, sometimes it can, re it can uh, remo remove meaning from your life. You no, you're no longer, no one is dependent on you anymore, you know, so you're alone now and you've lost that bond. We know that it causes immune function decrease, cardiovascular disease, many things that can affect how the brain works. So I think that um, this is a very important area for people to investigate as to how we can help people who's lost partners, you know, and who have a risk for diseases like Alzheimer's or other diseases, how to shape their social structure to minimize the damage. Eu vou fazer, vou fazer a pergunta sim, em sim. português, que é a seguinte, eu trabalho na, nas áreas da filosofia e a questão que eu coloco, ou melhor, eu começo por fazer uma afirmação que, que pode ser discutida, não é? que é uma classificação da teoria das posições tomadas pelo Larry na, na sua exposição. Creio que é nitidamente a teoria evolucionista, ou o que eu chamo o materialismo evolucionista, neo-darioniano ou neo-darionista, e, e parece-me que aí, sendo assim, e eu pessoalmente não tenho assim dúvidas disso, do que eu conheço da, da vossa teoria, da vossa corrente, eu encontro um ponto morto, uma dificuldade. Vós, de uma maneira geral, tendes... Ou não, encontra, ou não encontram mesmo, ou tendes muita dificuldade em uh, explicar uh, como é que a consciência se constitui, porque uh, de algum modo subestimam 
ou sobreestimam a biologia e a química ou subestimam a externalidade social, a influência social, as relações sociais, numa, numa salva expressão, digamos assim, vulgar, não é? Vulgarizada e conhecida. A consciência, em grande parte, a meu ver, é devida na sua formação ao trabalho, às atividades produtivas ou à atividade, digamos assim, de uma maneira geral, à atividade, à ação humana, o, o, o trabalho produtivo ou o trabalho de uma maneira mais específica e a linguagem articulada com essas atividades que é cuja causa é social. Para, para concretizar uma pergunta para, para traduzir para o Larry, isso não é demasiado longo para eu conseguir traduzir pronto, tudo. Pronto, é, é, digamos, a pergunta está na crítica que eu estou a fazer, se quiser. Então, uma, uma crítica, crítica uma amistosa, claro, claro porque claro. evidentemente eu tenho imenso respeito por aquilo que ele escreve, por aquilo que ele, que ele pensa e pela corrente que ele representa okay. de alguma maneira. So I'll, I'll translate very briefly. I, th I think, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what was raised here was basically um, a dichotomy between, I, I would say, um, social constructivism on, on one hand, uh, uh, a view. Meaning what? Uh, uh, meaning that you can um, uh, explain, in this case, consciousness and, and behavior based on social uh, interactions, not necessarily on ec biological explanations. And so um, if, if I got it right, th this is a, a view that has been around for a while, that you can have different levels of explanation and that biological explanations do not take in account these um, social constructions, so, so to say. Uh, I don't know if you want to address it. This is something that is common in, in the field of people that study the mind and, and, and behavior. Um, I can take a personal yeah. uh, uh, view on that, or I can share my personal view. This was, a, was seen as a dichotomy for many years. I think currently people don't see this as a, as a dichotomy any longer. We can now understand how social relationships shape biological systems. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you explain behavior and the way the mind works through biological mechanisms does not mean that you don't uh, acknowledge that there are emergent properties that can be explained at, at different levels and that these levels feedback on biological mechanisms. So this very dichotomic way of seeing things as either uh, explained by biological determinism or social constructivism are no longer uh, the, the standard of, of the field. That would be my, my comment on your comment. Yeah, we can understand we can the interaction between, between those two the now. Two levels, yeah. yeah. So I agree with your answer. So should we move to another? Excuse, uh, good evening. I would like to ask uh, Larry from the scientific point of view, because it's it's kind of an, an obvious question, but trying to understand if there's some research or scientific research about it. Um, one of the things that we are most used for the last 15 years are the social media, social networks, and everything that goes with the internet. You have shown us a picture of your wife and told something about how do we, or you react to the, to the picture. And that picture could be on Instagram, for instance. Are you aware of any deep research on how the social networks, social media, could be developing that kind of chemical production in our brains throughout the world, and is, is it something that makes us subject to the, to, to the situation of what, what we receive from, from internet and, and social media? I, I mean, from the scientific point of view, because on a daily basis we, we, we see that happens, but I don't, I don't know if it's something that's from the scientific standpoint, it's So, so I, real. I think that social media kinds of things, um, do elicit dopamine, which is the reward. This is why we're always doing it, pressing the button, uh, like a rat pressing the button to get that retweet or something like that. But there have been studies that show that, um, for example, one study showed that a, 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 a young girl talking to the mother on the phone so she could hear the mother's voice, um, she got, had a release of oxytocin. But a text from the mother does not. So um, the, 
the, the voice is the, is the real biological signal, you know, the sound. Also, probably being in person, looking into the eyes of another person is what causes oxytocin to release. I don't think we get that from the uh, social media. So, uh, you know, maybe there's a, there's a whole lot of volume, and for some kids or some people, lots of volume of social media contacts. But I think that they're devoid of, or they have less, le they're less likely to be releasing oxytocin and more the same chemical that cocaine releases, which is dopamine. And we should be thinking about how this is affecting. Because I have, I have done studies in animals to show that that, for example, the stroking that a mother does to her variable babies, that causes oxytocin release when they are young. And that determines how they can bond later in life. So oxytocin develop, uh, released during infancy and all the way through in development, through all of our social interactions, shapes our brain and how we can relate to others later in life. And I think it's, you know, that social media is really affecting that, I think. Okay. Um, hello, thank you for your presentations. Larry, you said uh, that you wanted to try oxytocin in autism. But I didn't answer what you, what 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 was your experience? Did it res, did it result? Because my my feeling is that it would not, uh, because uh, it's not maybe it's not a question of wanting to relate or feeling like relating, uh, but uh, uh, an inability to do it. Right. So the inability to do it. That's the pro that see what oxytocin does is doesn't just make you want to to relate. Okay, that's the combination with dopamine. It feels good. Okay, but oxytocin makes social stimuli more salient to your brain, so you pay attention. People with autism don't look into the eyes. They don't read the emotions of other people. They don't understand what's happening around them in the social situation, and therefore, day after day after day, it's very awkward in the social world. Um, if you take that child and give it, uh, take them to a therapist, and so the therapist teaches them social skills, they learn to read people's emotions better, they get better in the, in the social domain. If you take a child, what I believe, and increase oxytocin, now suddenly their brain is paying attention to the therapist and learning social skills that may help them in their life. So it's, it's not about, um, it's, it's about helping them learn how to interact with others and how to receive information from others, just like behavior therapy works. But is it a question of learning or is it a question of it's too, too much disturbing and it's easier, for example, to relate to objects as they do? Right, but if you, so that may be true, but if you then jack up oxytocin, which specifically helps your brain be able to pay attention to social, social cues, then that may be better. So the social cues are dynamic, faces are moving, lots of things happening, but a train is very simple and you can line it up. So um, if, if you can jack up the brain's parts that are specially designed for processing social information, maybe the social world will not be too overwhelming because you can now better understand it. So that's the idea. We can take one or two Last questions before we close the session. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, so, talking about being social, I just would like to ask if in your department there is any, I don't know, like reunions, meetings that you talk with people from different departments and with different researchers. Because I also used to do like some internships in neuroscience and something that I really missed a lot was like this kind of dialogue in between the old, like different researchers and everything. I think would be like a real benefit. And I talked with some researchers and I didn't see a lot. So it's just like curiosity if in your department, in your university, you have this space to just like share with and you try to, to just side. like brainstorm and try to, to relate the researchers. Um, so we do at a couple of different levels. So one level is um, not at my institution, but is a society that 
both Rui and I were president of, in the past, the Society for Social Neuroscience. And in that, these are meetings that we go to every year where half of the people do animal research and do you know, real basic mechanisms kinds of stuff. And other half are human researchers. And, and those are two different fields that did not talk to each other in the past. And this, the effort behind this society uh, is to bring those two different people, people together. So I think there is more and more communications between hard scientists and psychology. But this is a, a pretty big stretch. We don't have this <laughs> <laughs> meetings, outreach. yeah, outreach kinds of things. So I think this kind of um, program right here is, is the best mechanism for facilitating that kind of communication. And where you also have the public uh, to, to also weigh into the uh, discussion. So we need to do more of these kinds of things. So can we have a final question? So my question is related to uh, Hunter, what well, Hunter was saying. So who's driving the bus? Who's calling the shots, let's say? Um, until which extent uh, can one manipulate its, his um, oxytocin stimuli uh, without the help of external sources? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. but. Um, you know, so could you meditate, for example, or think, think good thoughts, you know, think about your partner, um, or think about doing good in the community, does that release oxytocin? I, I think that that's an interesting question, and we just don't, we don't know that yet, but um, that, that is an area where we could have a lot of collaboration between fields. Something's going on, uh, we, we just don't know which chemicals are being activated, but the reports from the people are very clear when they do work in the community that benefits others, that they get a, a, a benefit in their head, something's going on. Uh, I don't know that it's been studied, but it's very few chemicals involved. It's dopamine or oxytocin. Well, maybe a few more that I'd... Yeah, but I mean... It's a little more complicated. They call it they call it the helper's high. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it's one of those. Yeah, it could... That would be, yeah. Okay, I would like to thank you both once again for taking our time to share ideas with us. Thank you for before, before closing, before closing um, I would just like to make the announcement that we had to cancel the Brain Dialogue session of Help Me, the date? 31. May uh, 31st, because uh, one of the speakers, uh, which uh, is becoming very high on oxytocin, uh, because she's pregnant, but unfortunately there were some complications with the pregnancy, nothing serious, but she cannot travel to come here and share her ideas with us. It, it's Amy from MIT, and so we will have, unfortunately, to cancel that. But I hope to see you here. Uh, next week, and I, I understand that Hunter wants to do something, no? Yeah, I just want to thank the Gulbenkian, and particularly Hui, for having us. Thank and you this, so much. this is something that we give our partners in recognition okay. of their partnering. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>